And if you're an adult, you may stay in here and sit down and be bored my, by my tones of <laughs> rambling on. They're probably having lots of fun, but let's try, please, just for me, so I have a good drive home to have some fun this morning. Last week, we talked about John, a man who had heard, seen, and touched what went on at Jesus' time. I talked about his credentials. This is very, very important. He uses the word hear, which is great. He heard Jesus spoke, but so did a lot of people. They heard Jesus. Crowds would gather. We know that Jesus fed a large amount of people, thousands, and they only counted men back then. So there was a lot of people there. We know that those people heard Jesus speak. But he also says that he saw, which would make him a little closer. I'm sure Jesus was a dot when there's 5,000 people out there. He also said he touched. And I think of the fact that after Jesus rose from the dead, he said, look at my hands and my feet, touch my wounds, see that it's me, Jesus. There was a physical contact that he would have had. I think we need to remember this, this because it's important. Those credentials are incredibly important. John has the credentials to write what we're studying, but he also has a purpose. He has a reason to write this. Think about it. People write history books all the time. People write opinion pieces. We have newspapers full of them, now an internet full of them. Newspapers, for those of you who are younger, those funny things we pull out. And... Anyway, they're for covering your head when it rains. The point being, we have no end of places to get opinions, but there's something more. He's not just writing a blog. He is writing an opinion with a purpose, with a God-called, God-ordained need for this to be written. Often I look at the church today and I think to myself, we're so far off. We're so far away from what I believe Jesus intended us to be. And I think many of you probably think the same thing. But then I think, why? And the first thought that comes to my head is Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, give or take a decade or two. So maybe we're just so far away from seeing him, hearing him, touching him, that we just get off track. If he showed up, it would be all fixed. That's a wrong assumption. To simply believe that because we're so far away in time and that's how we get off track is to not understand that people were getting off track even while Jesus was here on earth. That people were getting off track from the gospel, the message he was preaching a few years after he left. It's not how far away in time we get from Jesus, it's how far away from his teachings that causes our issues. And John is showing up to tell people, you're off. You're not on track. See, I, I do believe, and I think we all believe, that Christianity is a journey. You don't just become a Christian, you've arrived, and you just hang out here till you're dead and you're in heaven. There's more to be discovered. Boy, that sounds like an Ontario thing. Anyway, more to be discovered. <laughs> it's not my notes. It's things pop into my head. I need to be careful. The point being is that you live on this planet as long as God places you here with purpose. You're not just waiting. This isn't the waiting room for heaven. That's a Florida statement. Anyway, I don't know what happened to my, I'm way off track here. The point is we're here to learn and to grow. There's more to our lives than just being saved. And John is here to say that. And we're not just waiting to get saved or waiting to go to heaven and complete our salvation, there's things to be done. But I do believe as we try to discover more of God, to understand God more, we put him into our own terms. Great verses like, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. And when I read some of our modern commentaries and our modern opinions on how God works, I think to myself, are we that arrogant that we believe we can figure out exactly how God works? The gospel is simple. We complicate it to make ourselves more comfortable. We try and figure out a God who is mysterious. That is one thing I do miss about part of the more traditional church. As much as I love the freedom of not a liturgical service, there's something about the mystery of God, things we can't figure out. Maybe we'd do better if we just said, God, I don't know, but I believe you're in control. I believe your control doesn't change if I don't know what you're doing. What a change our lives that would be. But we always want to know more. I want to know God more. The problem is I tend to want to know more about him and try and figure him out. I don't enjoy him. I often said, say, if you believe that your marriage is better because you can draw out your wife or husband's DNA, 
you're being ridiculous. But we do this with our faith. We try and figure out God. We don't get to a relationship. We just try and figure him out. And the more we do it, the more our sinful ways come in. The more we make God understandable in our own terms and hold him to our own limitations. Limitations, by the way, that exist because he placed them there. Not in himself, but on all of us. John's purpose in this letter is to correct Christianity being mixed with popular ideas, Christianity being mixed with with different religious ideas. There were people making up a whole new religion calling it Christianity. As a matter of fact, if you look up a group called the Gnostics, they're often called the Christian Gnostics. Now that's an oxymoron because you cannot be a Christian and a Gnostic at the same time. Their belief system didn't work, although it included Jesus. Their belief system didn't match anything Jesus said when he was here on earth. But he had to correct that. They had a really strange belief, but it worked well. We gotta understand a lot of times when we figure out what Christianity is, it works well for us, right? It, it's easier for us to understand, more palatable when we talk to our friends. Some of what we teach is not the hard stuff because we don't want anybody not to like us. They had a system that worked with some of the religions of the day. One of the things they believed was that there is spirit and there is body and they are not really connected. In other words, the spirit was perfect, made by a great God, The body was imperfect, made by a lesser God. Now, what does that lead to? They believed no matter how grotesque the sin was, it was okay because the body did that, but the spirit was saved. Can you see the problem already? It's actually a great idea, isn't it? I can go do what I want and still go to heaven. That system doesn't match, but it causes one more problem. How did Jesus in his perfection show up on this planet, not sin, but be in body form? So they went past that. They said Jesus didn't show up as a man. He showed up as spirit and disguised himself as a man. That fits their system. You see, you go a little far off, then you need another thing to go off. And before you know it, you've got Jesus showing up as a totally different entity than the one we believe, which is fully God and fully man. They had to come up with these ideas, and John is saying, I have credentials. Remember, if Jesus wasn't really a man, he didn't really die. But remember, John said, I touched him, or I touched, I felt, I saw. He is confirming that this was human. This thing they called the Savior and Messiah actually existed in physical form. He's trying to put away the idea it was a floaty spirit faking it as a human being, like some FX scene from a movie. But really, he bled real blood, and he died. John is being black and white to avoid people from creating their own religion down the center. John is saying you're either in or you're out. You can't have this idea that Jesus isn't what Jesus said he was or Jesus is a liar. Remember what we studied last week. It said, if you claim to not have sin, you're a liar or you make Jesus out to be a liar. Those are the two references. Why? Because the Gnostic believes that you didn't have sin because your body didn't matter and your spirit was clean and it was okay to go to heaven. And he's saying, no, no, they're attached. It's not a duality. They are the same thing. The Gnostics had created a problem, and they had infiltrated Christianity, not 2,000 years later like us, but probably about 80 years later, they were basically taking over Christianity. So Jesus was there, walking the streets of Jerusalem, not long before, and they'd already gotten off track. As soon as we're willing to create a religion that suits us, we are in trouble. And when we believe that sin doesn't matter, we're in big trouble because we nullify what Jesus did. Why die if sin doesn't matter? Why would the Son of God come to earth, give up his life, live in an imperfect world if it really didn't matter? John is saying this needs to change. We need to understand the truth. We need to correct these teachings, but he's saying it from a person who was there and could prove it. If sin really does matter in our lives, if we really cannot say we are without sin, if we can't say that it doesn't matter, we can't separate ourselves and say, this is the spiritual being, it's all okay, and this is the me being, and I can do what I want, then we got a problem that needs to be solved. John says that in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. I love what he says. 
because he both gives us responsibility in what he says for our actions, but also gives us a way out, not the Gnostic way out, which says that, hey, you can do what you want, it doesn't matter. But he actually tells us that Jesus is there for us, but asks us to respond by trying to be holy, by living a life without sin. He says this, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. So he's saying, I'm explaining these things so you won't sin. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. You see, the second part of the verse is great. We take the but out. Well, if you sin, Jesus is there for you. But he says more. He says, I write this so you will not sin, as though we have some responsibility. The Gnostics were saying we're not responsible. I would suggest that sometimes in today's culture we say we're not responsible. One of the toughest things in Christianity is this. We know we cannot be perfect enough to make God happy and save us. So we know we need Jesus. But we know when we have Jesus, we need to be perfect or holy to please him. But we can't. And that's where we create theologies that instead of keep the tension of you can't do it, but you need to do it, we create theologies that say you can't do it, so don't worry about it. We talked about it last week, the nobody's perfect theology, so why even try? You will miss the mark, but you are asked not to. If you truly love God, you'll desire to please him, knowing that you'll never be able to fully please him. I wonder if we treated our closest relationships like we treat our relationship with God. I will never be the perfect father or spouse or mother or child, so therefore I won't try. I will never make my whoever it is in your life that's important to you perfectly happy, so I won't even bother. As a matter of fact, I'll do things to hurt them. That is what we're saying when we say sin doesn't matter. That our relationship with God, because we can't do it perfectly, isn't even worth pursuing. John is saying, no, that's not true. You need to be without sin, but if you mess up, there's incredible grace. There should be no fear in this message, but there should be no permission to go on sinning. The Gnostics created a great way. Think about it. You're going to heaven. You don't have to worry because your sin doesn't matter. It's not the right way, but it is a great way. It's a more comfortable way, isn't it? We want comfort. We want to hear about Jesus dying for our sins and nothing matters and we don't want to worry about it. But John wants us to hear about responsibility and response. People, I don't understand how it works. I know God judges the heart, but I want to tell you right now, I don't fully understand this. I don't understand how God can say to us that we can't save ourselves and ask us to do things to affect our salvation. I just know that God looks at the desires we have for him and offers grace to those who are willing to follow him. I would never stand up here and say, if you don't get it right, you're not going to heaven. But I do know there's something in there we're called to do. I would rather be trying my hardest to please God knowing I can't than trying to get away with it whatever I can. I would rather be trying my hardest and asking God for his help and his power to end sin in my life than going, who cares? I'm not worried. The Gnostics created a religion that allowed you not to care. Well, how does that apply to us today? I'm assuming no one here would even know the word Gnostic. Maybe a few of you do, but it's certainly not something you've explored. I don't think most of us would be Gnostics here. I think most of us at least, we, we may not understand how Jesus could be fully God and fully man, but we would say that, that there was a mystery there that God could come down in the flesh. Most of us probably don't think that our spirit is totally separate from our body. We would say that it is separated when the body decays, but right now we'd say we're one unit. And yet somehow John's words have to apply. Why, when God inspired the people to put together the books of the Bible, did that remain? Why was this important to people now 2,000 years later and not just important to those who he was trying to correct, the Gnostics? 
Well, there are two things from Gnosticism. It sounds like something from Star Trek, the Gnostics. But anyway, there's two things from this Gnostic group that can trickle their way into our lives. The first is we can take popular religion, popular ideas, popular comfortable things, and popular culture and shove them into our faith and try and make them work. I said last week, we often try to get the Bible to align with us rather than get ourselves to align with the Bible. That's the first thing they did that we can do. And the second thing is, we can follow a system that removes personal responsibility and response to the gospel. I'm saved, let's wait, Jesus comes back, we're out of here. God didn't leave you here with nothing to do. If salvation was all it was about, he would have called you home. God made a way so you could spend eternity with him. Why would he be separated with you on earth when you could be in his presence unless he had purpose to it? One of them is the obvious. It's to spread our faith, to tell people about Jesus. But I think there's another one that we forget. It is to be in relationship with God and understand God just a little bit more. Yes, he can go like that and you will fully understand. But God has a purpose for us to go through things and experience them. To learn that we do not want to sin. I can only make this assumption that when we get to heaven, the more on earth we have enjoyed that desire not to be in sin, the more we'll enjoy the perfection in heaven of not being in sin. The more we learn what pleases God, the more we will be pleased to be in his presence, naturally pleasing him free of sin. Something's going on down here that we're responsible for, or God would have ended it all. Now, what do we do with this? How do we figure this out? Well, it's a tough one. How do we live our lives without fear, because we know we can't do it, and yet still try and do it? Not depends on what God you trust. You trust a God that is perfect, whose ways are perfect and above yours, or do you trust a God that if you don't understand him, he can't be followed? It's a very difficult thing, but John goes on further and pushes the idea further. If you have friends or you yourself are thinking that sin doesn't matter or that sin's a bad thing, but Jesus took care of it and that's all there is to it, then you need to throw out the book of John, actually some of the gospel too. Because John goes on and says this in verse 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys the word, God's love is made complete in him. Okay, wait a minute here. Those are pretty dead on sets of information. If you don't obey his commands... You're not with him. Now again, we either rip this book out or we realize we have responsibility. It's your choice. I'm going to suggest you don't rip the book out. I'm going to suggest that John has something important to say. Why? Because he was in the presence of Jesus and he believes this is what Jesus was getting across. And we'll get to that in a moment. So he says, but if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Wow. We just talked about I can't be perfect. And he just said, walk as a man who was perfect. Walk as Jesus did. He starts the chapter off saying, I tell you this so you won't sin. So he's already getting at the point we don't want to sin. And then he goes further in and says, walk as Jesus did. Whether you were a Gnostic in the past, or today you are a type of person that believes the misguided idea that sin, well, it's no big deal. That you are immune to sin or sin doesn't affect you. John is saying it does. He's saying to the crowd he's writing to then and to now, sin matters. We need to act like Jesus acted. Just because you believe Jesus was fully God and fully man, just because you believe Jesus really did die, doesn't mean that's enough. Again, I don't know how God's going to work this out, but I do know he asked me to be something. And if I want my love for God to be complete, I need to respond to his request. And maybe that's where we get off track. COVID's horrible. Life is stressful. Take COVID out, it was still stressful. 
maybe some of that stress comes from the fact that we are not living the way God called us to live. Maybe some of that stress comes from the fact that our love isn't complete because we think it's easier just to go sin doesn't matter. And I guess technically it's easier because you don't have to do anything. But you're missing the joy of relationship with God. There's nothing like when you do something for someone you love. You do what they need, that sense of completion, of truly showing love. Why would it be any different between us and God? If I say my most important relationship is with God, why would I do less for God than I would do for my wife or my kids? John is saying sin matters. Do something about it. So this responsibility-free version of Christianity that's crept in needs to go. We're missing out. There's a bonus. Our love is complete when we do what we're asked to do. I don't know how we got to where we got. I don't know how I got there, where grace became so important that God wasn't. Where grace became so free that there was no requirement. I often say God's grace is like air. There's air around us, it's free, except when you want to pump your tires up. But there's air around you, it is free. But if you don't breathe it in, you still die. There is a responsibility and a requirement to have air in your lungs, and there's a responsibility and requirement to accept God's grace. And that is to live as we're asked to live. Jesus laid it out. Let's go to the Gospels here. In case you're going, well, that's just a letter by the John fellow. Let's hear what Jesus had to say. Well, let's hear how John recorded Jesus' words in the Gospel of John. John 8, verses 31 through 36. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are my real disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I love the next part. This is a little off topic here, but it's what's said. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. We have never been slaves to anyone. Anybody know the Bible very well? Remember the story we all learned about Pharaoh and the slaves? That's a moronic thing to say. Jesus, the perfect one, we've never been slaves. What was going on? They weren't actually slaves, but they were pretty close to it. The Romans were their overlords, controlled them, and they're going, we've never been slaves. So it's kind of a dumb thing to say, but it does allow Jesus to give this answer. I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We all sin, don't we? We're all slaves to sin. Jesus is saying we sin, but then before that he says, hold to my teachings. He's saying do something about it, because what were Jesus' teachings? They were love and grace, but they were also requiring that we act in a godly manner. He was talking to a society that had come up with rules that weren't godly, that didn't involve love, grace, and a desire to be holy. God said to his people, I think it's Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. What a weird request from a God who says you can't do it unless there is a part of us that should desire to be holy. Does God contradict himself when he says, be holy as I am holy? Or is he asking us to do something? Even though he knows we cannot fully accomplish it, he desires that we attempt it. A demonstration of love. So, he goes on. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. We love these verses when we remove the, the context. Well, if Jesus says us free, we're free indeed. What did Jesus say before that? He said, if you hold to my teachings, you are my disciples. That freedom comes when we go past the point of going, well, free gift, I'll take it, and say, I will live it. Jesus didn't just teach these teachings, he lived them. That's really important. When Jesus says, hold on to my teachings, in other words, follow my teaching, he said, be like me. So in 1 John, when we read, whoever claims to live in him must walk in him, it's exactly the same thing as Jesus saying, hold to my teachings, because Jesus walked in the teachings, the word of God given to him as he walked as a man. 
These are important things. Often we get these arguments, Jesus never said anything about living a right life. He just said, you're free, you're safe, it's okay, don't worry about sin. He did say that if you sin, you're a slave to sin. He said he would set you free, but he also requires you to do something. Again, the balance is difficult. I don't want to be legalistic, but this free gift is going to cost you your life. Obedience is surrender, and surrender is what we are to do in our relationship with God. Jesus was without sin. We're to walk like him. Now, if that scares you, think of this. If you mess up, if you miss the mark, God already knew that was going to happen. He's taking care of it. It's not an excuse. It's just a fact not to live in fear. We can work hard at being more like Jesus, knowing that when we fail, he comes alongside with grace. This is a bad theology because I don't know that I can work it out fully, but let me give you an idea of how I want to live my life. I want to take up as little grace as possible. It sounds weird, but I want to need God's grace less and less. The problem is I am sinful by nature and probably need it more than I know. But wouldn't it be nice to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and realize what God was saying is your deepest desire was to be obedient to me. That's what a faithful servant does with his master. I can't earn my way into heaven. But I can't get into heaven by not embracing Jesus' commands. Not just the easy ones, the comfortable ones, but the tough ones that says, be like me. The Gnostics made sin irrelevant, and in today's Christianity, often in North America, we make sin irrelevant because it's not a palatable idea, not a concept we want to hear. The Gnostics turned it into something spiritual versus physical, The Christian simply said, God, you have it figured out. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Do you want incredible joy? Do you want peace in your life? Do you want your love to be made complete for God? Then follow Jesus' teachings. I feel safe in God's grace. I have assurance of heaven. I'm not worried as long as I follow God. And I understand grace kicks in because I can never follow him perfectly. But when I say I couldn't be bothered, I say I'm not interested in Jesus. I am rejecting salvation when I reject Jesus as my Lord and Savior, as my Master and my God. These are tough teachings. We need to align ourselves with what we're being asked to do. These are things that your friends don't want to hear. These are things we soften up because they seem so black and white, but are they? Yes, it's your in or your out, but the only gray area is the fact that Jesus actually says, I'll step into the area where you mess up and actually let you be in. It's not really gray as much as it's something that we would say, you either don't sin or you do sin, but Jesus said, if you do sin, I'll move you back to the light through my blood. That's a great message, but it's not the one we often teach because it's uncomfortable. 1 John 2, 1 through 6, this is the challenge. Walk like Jesus. Walk without sin. This is a promise. Love will be made complete. Your relationship will grow and will blow up. It'll be so incredible. And this is the confidence when we miss the mark. Jesus' blood covers it all. The choice is ours. We need to align ourselves. Or we can make excuses and make up our own religion. But let me assure you of this. From what I've read in the Bible, God's plan is not designed to fit into your religion or your excuses. God's plan is designed through grace for those who are willing to align themselves with him. Do not leave here afraid to make mistakes, but don't leave here living in your mistakes and your sin and thinking that's okay. It's tough. But I'll bet you this week, if first thing you try not to sin, sin, second thing you recognize those sins, and you say to God, I am sorry, change me that you will experience a love that you've never experienced before. I'm going to try it too. Because I'm not very good at this. I just get to tell you all what's in the Bible. But the truth is, I'm learning too. I mess it up, but I know Jesus' blood washes me clean. And I know when I'm in relationship with God, I desire to please him. And what a wonderful, close relationship I have 
when I don't make up my own religion excuses. I simply say, God, I fall on your mercy, and I desire to do your will every single day. Sin matters. Obedience matters. Repentance matters. God is stronger than your sin, but he desires that you are willing to give it up. Can we do that? As a church, as we transition, can we say sin matters? We want to be a people that desire to be perfect. And then can we teach that to people? The grace of God will cover you when you mess up. But if you want a great relationship with someone who will never let you down, learn to serve his desires and be obedient. I think that's a better message. Why don't we go back to that 2,000 years later? Because Jesus may not be coming back for another thousand years. He may come back tomorrow. But from here to when he comes back, or I go up there, I want to live more and more obedient to him. Because I love him. and I want that love to be complete. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't understand all this. It's difficult. It's so hard to understand how we can't be perfect, and yet you desire us to be perfect. It just seems to be so counterintuitive, and yet God... A lot of things you say are counterintuitive because we are sinful and you are perfect. Help us to accept that you are a mighty God, a perfect God, a God whose plans is only to bring us joy and to complete our relationship with you. I ask you to help each one of us this week to sin less and enjoy you more and to fall on your grace when we fail. In your name we pray, amen.